All right, welcome to module three, C sharp logic planning and decision making. This is our first module. So let's go ahead and get into it. So as you can see right here, what we're looking at right now is understanding something very important. What does it mean to plan? Like, what are we planning in the first place? Why are we planning in the first place? Why don't we just go out there and do it? Well, there's a couple of things that we need to take into consideration before we decide to start developing something. And what we need to understand is that when we plan, we're planning the sequence and flow of the code that we want to write. And that planning process is a pre-development activity. Now, in the development space, we call this the design phase. The software development lifecycle states that the de design phase is the phase where software developers define the technical details of the product depending on the project these details can include screen designs, databases, sketches, system interfaces, and prototypes. And those are just high level. There are so many other pieces of information that are important within the design phase, such as flow charts to understand how the data is flowing, uh, user diagrams to understand how the user is using the actual program and what the design of that looks like. You know, there's so much that goes into it that, you know, this is just scratching the surface of what you're gonna need when you do design. Now, what's important, all right, what's important about the design phase is that the developer does not design the program in a vacuum, all right? And if left to their own devices, developers are known to over-engineer products when they have too much time on their hands or there's too much anxiety in the project. The anxiety of failure can make the project become a project that never deploys because folks are too scared of any part of it failing, right? So normally what we, what we like to do, the sweet spot is the normal design phase is preceded by requirements gathering. And in a perfect world, that's normally done by the project team members other than developer thing, folks like the project manager, the uh, business analyst and things like that. But in most situations that I've ever been in in most situations that I would say other developers have been in, Requirements gathering is not just a project manager or a business analyst activity, it is also a developer activity because there are certain situations where the, the actual business requirements are gathered, but there's something missing. And there are things that are missing because when the developer is looking at the requirements, the developer is asking themselves, can this be done? Um, is there a better way? Is there something that's more efficient? And then weighing what that feasibility analysis looks like. So it is integral that the developer be a part of the initial requirements gathering and ongoing requ requirements, um, not honing, but requirements uh, grooming so that as the program or as the project progresses and the program is designed and subsequently written, if we continue to address the requirements through the design phase, into the development phase, into the testing phase, and so on and so forth, some would argue testing goes on the entire time. But I mean, that's neither here nor there. Uh, what you really want is requirements grooming as the program parses through these different SDLC lives, SDLC states, because the requirements may need to change or the requirements may indeed change. The business may adapt and overcome. Now, I spent a lot of time speaking about this, but at the end of the day, this is just for your situational awareness. I mean, understanding that this is what you're going to encounter when you get to the real world is very important. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I'm not going to go too deep into the weeds about what this even means. This is more of a programming in C Sharp uh, uh, class versus understanding how uh, software development lifecycle, project management, and um, real world development team activities work. I will intertwine those into this conversation just so you understand what you're getting yourself into based on the workload and the things that you're going to encounter in the workforce. But otherwise, I want to speak more clearly about C Sharp and what that's up to, what, what we're doing there. So with, with, that, with that in mind, what are some design phase tools that we use? Well, the first one that we use, and this is not in the order of sequence that I would have liked it to be in. Um, I didn't realize that until I put it up here. But if you look at the second box, the blue box flow chart, that's the number one way for a developer to very quickly get an understanding and design of the way certain pieces of the code will work. Uh, flow charts are normally used for user interface. You know, are we gonna make the users, is, does there need to be a decision 
made at the business level on this form? Um, should the should the program itself do something based on the data that it received? If it receives some sort of data, that's where the flow chart really comes into play. A, you understand what events are occurring within the flow of the program, but you're also mapping those events. So those events tell you things like how the data flows, when the event is triggered, how the event is completed, what should happen after the event is finished, what should be available before the event begins, things like that. The second major thing, and if you're taking my actual collegiate course, um, the pseudocode is what I care about. So flow charts are all nice and good, but you can spend a lot of time putting together a very beautiful flow chart. In the end, I don't want you to be Visio jockeys. I, yes, I want you to learn Visio, understand BPMN, get, get to a point where your requirements and your design are very closely intertwined so that when you deliver, the end results, that it's close enough to the requirements that your acceptance criteria is met. The overall user acceptance of the program will be high. But for the sake of my course and for the sake of other engineers, we actually don't care about flowcharts nearly as much. I mean, we do read them, but nine times out of 10, they don't give us enough information. So we, we would rather have pseudocode. We can read the pseudocode very quickly and understand what should be happening in the program versus what is happening, right? Your pseudocode is a representation of what should happen. Your code should conform to your pseudocode, which means that you are writing your pseudocode first. You write your pseudocode first, and then you write your code after that. Now, this is not in a vacuum. This is not always, I mean, this has not always happened. Normally, pseudocode is very rarely written in the teams that I've worked on because we're moving so quickly. Writing the code twice just seems inefficient. But that's also because when you're on a team full of senior engineers, it's inherent. It's implicit. Implicit meaning that it should be a natural part of your everyday life to understand what you're looking at when you read code. And we write a truckload of flowcharts. And then sequence, sequence structure. And that's it, really. I wanted to go over one more thing with you, and that's understanding some key points to pseudocode. All right. These key points are very important. Now, what I would say is if you want more information on how to write, write pseudocodes, write pseudocode, I would use the link below. Or I would Google pseudocode examples. There are some really good examples in Google. It doesn't necessarily need to be um, parsed because they're all simple or they're all the same. But one thing, I a couple of things I want to point out, use proper naming conventions for the names of your variables and classes, for the names of your methods, use those in your pseudocode, right? Uh, indentation and white space are very important. So if you have an if statement, the blocks in the if or the block of the if statement should be indented with all the programming statements. Um, keep it simple. Don't 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 go stir crazy, right? You know you want your sentences to be understandable and quick to under, quick to comprehend. Quick to comprehend. You don't want your engineer or your business user sitting there trying to decipher hieroglyphics because they do not understand the complexity of the statement that is written. It needs to be very simple and keep it concise. Keep it short. All right. What are some don'ts? Don't make pseudocode abstract. Do not in imply, oh, this is a process that is executed somewhere else. Therefore, I will not write what that process is doing. It needs to be written out in your pseudocode as well. Don't be too generalized. Don't speak in parables. Uh, don't be cryptic. Speak specifically about what you're doing. Declare variable X. Initialize variable Y. Execute method three, whatever. It needs to be specific to the point Simple, concise, so that when someone sees it, it is plain Jane simple. Whatever explanations you want to put inside your pseudocode, that should go into your technical specifications document based on a purpose statement with an explanation of why. That's also very important. Normally, when you write pseudocode, the why will hit you while you're writing the pseudocode. Literally, it'll bust out of the closet and, go, and you're like, oh, now I know why I'm doing this. Or if it's been a long time and you're reading it again, right? Let's say somebody asks you to update your code because of a new requirement years later. And so you're like, all right, cool. You get into your solution and you're like, I have no idea why I did this. Well, if you wrote the why before, you can just go back and read it and go, right, I forgot about that. There's like three other layers. Okay, I remember now. The whole entire situation, the traumatic experience will come back to you about why you had to take the path that path over another path. I use the word traumatic because sometimes you're like, why can't we just do this, right? And there's a lot of other blockers in your job 
that are blocking you, right? Oh, you can't use that because of a firewall or you're not allowed to use. It's always some kind of like RPG quest requirement where it's like, oh, well, you can't do that. As a matter of fact, instead of just walking down the road, you have to hop, skip and jump down the road. And every third skip, you have to scream, you know, I love pumpernickel bread or something like that. Like it's always some stupid requirement that stops you from getting to the end of the road. And I say the word stupid very lightly and loosely. So please don't understand. Please understand that I'm not trying to put anybody down, but sometimes I feel like those requirements are not, it's just, it's just meaningless. Right. You know, so, but they're, they're important to the business. And so you have to keep, keep, if you can convince them that it's unnecessary, uh, then do so honestly, but in most situations, that's very difficult to do. So you have to parse through these different situations, but either way, Pseudocode is written to be simple and concise. So this is what I'm looking for. Like I said, review some examples to give you an idea of what to write. Otherwise, it should be pretty straightforward. So as I say in all my videos, um, I want you guys to take your time, learn the material, get through it. Um, this class is not to learn C Sharp. This class is to learn how to develop. I'm just going to show you how to use C Sharp in doing that. Um, so as I say in all my videos, good luck. Have fun. Ciao.